All right, so we were just talking about how to rotate a point using some matrix multiplication. We got the results from a printed list, but it's a little hard to tell if these results are right. And this is a good example of how the human brain is really set up to look at things, not read lists of numbers. And for that, we need a plotting library. So the most advanced plotting library in Python is definitely matplotlib. There are other options, but this one's great. Um, so we'll import that and give it the nickname PLT. Then just to kind of warm up, let's do an example where we plot square root of x. x equals some range from 0 to 1, and then we'll just plot the square root. So we know how to get a range of values. It's the lin space function we talked about last time. And then the function from plt we need, so now we're doing plt dot, not numpy dot, we'll give it plt plot is our function. We'll use x along the x-axis, and our y values will be just the square root of x. And it worked, right? So here's our values ranging from 0 to 1. And of course, the square root of x also ranges from 0 to 1 then, but curved. Of course, you should always label your plots in engineering. So here's how you add an X label. Here's the Y label. Notice that I can use uh, LaTeX to get that square root symbol, uh, which is exactly how I get it in the markdown also, just slash square root. So it's the same thing. Learn LaTeX once and apply it both to the writing and to the plots, so that's nice. I also don't like rotating the things because I don't want people turning their heads if they don't have to. If they don't fit, then I'll rotate it, but otherwise I think it's good to have it zero. Okay, and then the last function here is to show the plot. So this shows you the basic way you make plots with PyPlot. You start with the data, and then you plot it, and then you can add more lines, modifying, customizing, and making that plot a little nicer. So there are a lot of options. I recommend you go to the matplotlib website. And you can look at the demos. There's a bunch of demo plots that you can see if you're interested in one type of plot or another. There's almost certainly an example. Okay, let's make this plot now. So we've got our rotation function here, rotate point, and then we'll go through the different angles here in the list, zero, pi over eight, and so on. And then finally, we'll plot those. So here, the output would give us a vector p but I'm breaking that up into the X and Y component. And I can do that in one line, which is nice and convenient. Uh, then I'll use a scatter plot. Instead of trying to plot a line, this is just gonna be one point. So scatter plot's better. I'll also add a label so that I can tell what angle each of those points are coming from. All right, otherwise it's pretty much the same. Uh, there are two new things. The other one is that there's a legend so if I don't add the legend here, so I can comment that out and run again, then I can't tell which one of these things was which. So I have to activate the legend. And then the last thing is that since I'm trying to tell if I've made an arc like I should, then it's important that the axes be equal so a circle looks like a circle. And indeed it does. So this looks like a semicircle. I can see that as I sweep through these colors, I'm sweeping through this rotation. So yes, my function works. Great, this is a nice visual check. Let's do one more plotting function. So notice that there's kind of a lot of baggage with PyPlot. There's a lot of things that you need to do. And so if you're ever going to make the same or a similar figure repeatedly, you should really wrap them up together in one function and just call it. You don't wanna be copy pasting stuff all the time. Um, so in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a polar plot. So this polar plot, again, I need to get the x and y coordinates, but now the job is a little bit easier. I'm just going to say, given some value of q, I'll evaluate a function f at this point q, and that'll be the radius of that. So the distance is given by r, and the angle is given by q. So of course, x is just cosine of q times r, and y is just sine of q times r, okay? And indeed, that's really all there is to it here. So I've called the function func, and I've applied this function to a set of input points. 
This could be one point if I only wanted a one point plot, but it makes more sense that I'd have an array of points. And I've given a default value here going from zero to two pi equally spaced, but the user could redefine that. I don't need to make that choice for them. Uh, then once I have the values of R, I can get the values of X and Y. So I'll make a line this time, so I'll just use the plot function, not scatter. I label X and Y, and I keep the axis equal as before, okay? So really the only new thing here is that the input is not an array, it's a function. So I could say define a cardioid function. So this takes in Q, and it returns two times one minus cosine Q. And the output's a cardioid. So it looks pretty good. We can see we're getting that kind of sort of heart shape that its name comes from. Uh, the neat thing about assigning a function as an argument, it's something that happens a lot in numerical analysis, right? You might want to integrate a function or take the derivative or find the zero or optimize it or whatever. So that sort of thing happens a lot. So to, to keep it easy to define functions very quickly, Python has this lambda syntax. So it's very similar to the def syntax, except now we don't need a name. So before we named the function and then we substituted the name in as an argument, now we're just going to do the whole thing inside the argument spot. So lambda times, this is our argument Q, and then I don't need a return statement because it's always just gonna return one line thing, which in this case will be Q over pi. And so that'll give me a spiral, right? As I increase Q, I increase the radius, and so I spiral around. So you can go through and try some other plots, see if you can make some pretty polar plots. All right, good. I think it's time now for a serious engineering example, something we haven't been able to do before. We haven't had the background tools, but now we do. So what I wanna do is a Monte Carlo simulation, very practical engineering thing to assess like risk and reliability. And that's what we're gonna do. We're going to figure out the potential failure of a fuel oil pump. We're gonna use a simple model of this, but it's still going to be a really good example of the sort of thing you really couldn't do without programming, okay? So thinking of a fuel oil pump, basically we're gonna treat this like a little black box and there's going to be pressure that's coming in here. There's always the inlet pressure. And then of course the job of a pump is to have a larger output pressure on the other side, forcing fluid through but if this pressure on the inlet gets too low, it drops behind below some threshold value, then the pump will fail. You can't overcome this incredibly low head. All right, so to do that, we really need two things. First, we need to just figure out a way of generating inlet pressures. And then second, we'll do some analysis on that. So for the first part, I'm just gonna use a random walk. I think that's the easiest way to illustrate what we're doing. In this case, we'll just use the random int function we saw before. So we'll either pick minus one, zero, or one, because it's up to but not including two. And I'll do that for a whole long list of stuff. So we'll do in steps and then I can set however many I want. So those are gonna be little steps, basically a step up in pressure, no change, or step down in pressure with equal probability. And then to get the pressure signal, I just have to add those all together cumulatively, right? A cumulative sum will add together those steps and give me the signal. And if you Googled cumulative summation numpy, then you'd get this one, which is cumulative sum. So a very nice little uh, function to know. All right, so in three lines, we've finished writing this function. Really, really simple. Uh, but we can test it and we can see that it's worked great. So just a couple more lines and we can generate a plot. So here I've just done a line plot. I've asked for some pressure signal of 200 points, 200 steps. And I said, give me five of those because plotting one random line wouldn't be nearly as fun. So we'll do it five times to get five different lines. And of course I label my axes properly. Every time I run this, I'll get a different set of pressure signals. Also really nice is that I don't just have to run 200 tests. I could run much, much longer pressure signals like this. And because Python's happy to give me really big lists of random numbers, no problem, it's not slow at all.
okay? So that takes care of this problem very nicely. So that works, but remember that we're also interested in hitting some limited value so that we know that we've failed, that the pump isn't going to be able to continue. And we wanna do some analysis on how often that happens, okay? So how can we write a function that takes in one of these pressure signals and it finds the first time that some threshold value is exceeded, okay? So in fact, again, just a couple lines of code and we can do that. So we'll write this function pump failure. It'll take in that list, the array of pressure values. And we have to of course set what we want that lower limit to be. Here I've defaulted to minus 15, but we could change it however. Then four, and then here I'm using a new function called enumerate. So enumerate goes through the list just like a regular for loop but instead of just returning the value, it also returns the index. And we need that because I don't just want to know that it's crossed a threshold. I want to know when it crossed the threshold, at what time. So this way I can just say if the new pressure, the pressure at this time is equal to or lower than my lower limit, then I return that index and that's the time. So I'm done, this is the whole thing. If I happen to go all the way through and I never reach that, then I can return the length of the whole list as the output, or I could have returned anything. I could have returned a failure or something like that. This just seems like a, a reasonable default. Okay, so let's try it. All right, so here I've written a little test code. So the way it works is that it starts with all zeros, and then it picks a random point in time for me to switch over to minus 20. So it's all zeros up to some random point, and then it spits out minus 20s after that. I could have just hard coded one test, but this way I can go through and test a couple different things and make sure it always works. And indeed, our function is giving the correct failure time no matter when it happens in this list. So that's a really nice little test function here, again, using assert. All right, so we're done. We've got a function that generates random pressure fields and a function that checks when failure happens. All we have to do now is generate a bunch of data and look at it. So we'll do that here. We'll make a list in this case of failure data. That'll be done with a list comprehension. I'll run my code in runs time. So this is like how many simulations am I doing? How many Monte Carlo simulations? Then for each one of those, I generate a random pressure walk and I test when the failure was. And that's it. So in one line, basically, we're generating all of our data now that we've made these two simple functions. Okay. Then once I've got that, I can plot it. So let's take a look. So even though I'm running 10,000 simulations, that was pretty fast. It just ran in a second. So we've got the histogram. That's what we've asked for. And we're just plotting in the failure data. Since it's a histogram, it counts how many happen in each bin. And here I've specified the bins. I want them to be 10 wide, otherwise they looked too wide. So here we can see really interesting result. First is that a lot of the pumps fail very quickly. So within the first 200 steps, that's kind of the mode, right? It's the most common is that you'll get failure maybe 150 steps. But it's a really fat tail. So you get a lot of these pumps which last much, much longer. And so maybe we're also interested in how many made it past the 1,000. So we can do that too. All right, so here we've taken the failure data, we've turned it into an array, and then we've said how many of these equal in steps. And it, there's a bunch that are false and a bunch that are true. And there's another function, numpy count non-zero. And now this will count all the places where this array is true and tell me. Whoa, so out of the 10,000 simulations that we did, fully 4,300 of them didn't even fail at all. So we have this really interesting situation that happens a lot in risk and reliability, where things might fail very early, or they might never fail at all. And so we have a very non-normal distribution here. Uh, and it's really easy to see with just a few lines of simulation code. All right, here's the two exercises for you now. 
first, our probability distribution we used for steps wasn't great, right? So we said that either it stays still, or it goes one greater, or it goes one less. And we gave these an equal probability of happening. And those are our only three choices. Um, but probably in reality, what we want is something that looks a little bit more like a normal distribution. So as your first additional exercise, why don't you look how to sample a Gaussian distribution, use that to update our pressure steps code. So pressure steps, before we did the rand int function and we pulled these blue points, but now I want you to pull from this Gaussian. And if you do that, the walks are gonna look different and also this final result is gonna look different. The second thing is that it's also possible for a pump to fail because of excessively high pressure. So far we've only been interested in low pressure, but excessively high pressure is bad too. It won't fail right away. Instead, what'll happen is that you'll just stress out the pump. So we could set some upper limit value of pressure. And instead of saying, when does that happen? maybe we want to add up all the time that was spent above this threshold. So write a function to return that accumulated time that the pump spends above the threshold value. Okay, again, two really practical engineering problems. All right, see you.